Good evening, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome uh, to this uh, Cabinet Committee meeting of Colchester Borough Council on Wednesday, October the 13th, 2021. I'll begin with a few um, housekeeping announcements and then we'll proceed with the meeting. Action, firstly, action in the event of emergency. There are no practice alarms planned for this evening, but if an alarm sounds, please evacuate the town hall by going down the main staircase or the back staircase to the high street and then to the car park behind the town hall in St. Runbrook Street. This meeting is being broadcast live over the internet on the Council's YouTube channel and will also be available to listen to afterwards. I want to confirm that all of us present in the room are adhering to the relevant government guidance on COVID-19. I can assure those watching that the meeting room is set up to meet social distancing requirements. Whilst we are not wearing masks while seated, these will be worn if and when we leave our seats. A COVID risk assessment has been undertaken for this evening. The use of mobile phones and other devices, including cameras by visitors, is welcomed, but you are requested to use them discreetly to set them to silent and not to use voice or camera flash functions. Speakers are reminded that microphones are to be used at all times. For the benefit of members of the public, I would like to explain that the Cabinet is the main executive body of the Council. It is responsible for day-to-day decision-making on all Council services and also makes recommendations to full Council on major policy issues and on, how the councils, on, and on the Council's budget. The Cabinet is made up of six councillors, each of whom is responsible for a particular range of services. And I shall now ask councillors and officers to introduce themselves, and we'll go around this way. I shall begin with myself. My name is Councillor Paul Dundas. I represent Stanway Ward, and I'm the leader of the council. Thank you. I'm Councillor Sue Lissimore, and I am Deputy Leader of Colchester Borough Council and Cabinet Member for Resources. Good evening, Councillor Darius Laws, Portfolio Holder for Economy, Business and Heritage. Good evening, Councillor Andrew Ellis, Portfolio Holder for Housing and Planning. Good evening, Beverly Oxford, Portfolio Holder for Communities. Good evening, Andrew Weavers, Monitoring Officer. Richard Clifford, Lead Democratic Services Officer. Thank you. We'll now proceed with the agenda. And item two is urgent items. Do we have any? There are no urgent items, Chair. We do not. Thank you. Uh, item three, declarations of interest. Uh, cabinet members, do you have any interest to declare? I see nobody indicating. Thank you. Item four is minutes of the last meeting on 1st of September 2021. Uh, are there any comments or matters arising from those minutes? So are we in agreement to approve them? I see that we are. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to item five, which is uh, have your say. We have three speakers under this item. Uh, the first is Mr. Dorian Kelly. Mr. Kelly, would you like to uh, approach? And you have three minutes. A bell will sound after two. Thank you very much. Um, now, what I want to talk about tonight to is uh, city status, as you can, might imagine. Um, a completely unscientific straw poll of my quite extensive arts and cultural network is very largely in favour of this, which is in sharp contrast to the comments on certain other um, local media comment pages. Uh, typically, uh, it's a waste of money, could be spent on potholes, etc., etc., etc. Personally, it's a complete mystery to me why we're not a city already. But a, a bid would cost next to nothing. I understand it comes out of existing budgets and would do no harm. And I hope you're minded to accept the recommendation. I'm glad to see it includes a recommendation that it's, um, the final wording be delegated to councillor laws. At least we know he'll be drawing on several years of thinking quite deeply about this. So the writing with a bit of luck won't be too corporate, a, a real turn off. Uh, I will put in a plea that the necessary public engagement process be properly staffed and properly funded to make it realistic. He can have a lot of help from the community locally, he only has to ask. Uh, but he's missed off a couple of really salient facts from his uh, notes in the document pack, and that is we are in fact the largest population in the region, beating our nearest rival South End by 18,000 people. That alone should work in our favour. 
He does mention we're a regional cultural destination, but so much more, we're actually the epicenter of the region's culture and heritage. I emailed Councillor Laws a partial list of our cultural offer and it impressed even me. We have more of everything than the rest of Essex and Suffolk put together and much of it is independent grassroots provision, something Colchester people are really good at with street festivals and the Fringe Festival and quite a lot of other things from the more commercial providers. He also mentioned our 2000 year heritage. I might remind him our culture goes actually back even further than that with the Bronze Age finds on hilly fields. But at this point, I'd like to put in a, a little um, reminder that our entire economic and social future lies in our cultural and heritage tourism. And this bid can only help and it can't hinder. So again, I do urge you to accept this motion. Um, it's great to see in the budget on another subject, the income for Colchester's important NPOs is going to be secured for four years, uh, should you see fit, of course, to agree. But it would be really good if a, a somewhat smaller amount could be hypothecated for equally important grassroots offer, a little bit of money per annum for those four years, and we can really make the place hum. We can do street festivals, we can do arts events, we can take over empty shops, we can do all sorts of things with just a little bit of funding. And I would put in a plea, please, to really think that whether this might be possible. Uh, these things really do make a difference. Thank, th thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. Yeah, um, this sounds very much like Councillor Law's specialist subject, so I think I shall hand over immediately to him. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, for coming along this evening and um, making that impassioned plea. Uh, it is my hope also that Cabinet this evening um, does agree to um, putting to full council uh, that we, we, we submit a bid for city status. I won't respond uh, on some of the detail now because we have that, that substantive item later on. And I know that there are a number of other speakers this evening that want to speak and I'll probably respond in the whole to that if that's okay, if you are able to hang on for that agenda item. But um, I've heard your plea about the need to consider funding uh, smaller cultural and arts um, opportunities. I've heard that, I I've made a note of it. Um, and um, I think I also detect from you the sentiment that you're pleased that we're going through the pro we're considering going through the process itself of of the bid um application because i think you're, you're suggesting that there might be some pr uh, benefits of the process itself in helping to put colchester firmly on the map in terms of all the great things that we have to offer here so thank you for your time and uh, i will speak substantially about this when we come to that agenda item Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Sir Bob Russell, who I do not think I need to uh, give instructions to. I think he knows how it works. Welcome, Sir Bob. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, just to briefly say on city application, having been involved in the previous ones, I hope Colchester Borough Council will continue its the decisions of previous councils in seeking city status, I can't imagine why anybody would not want to get the best for Colchester. But that wasn't the reason I wanted to speak, Chairman. I wanted to speak very briefly on Middlewick and ask the Cabinet to grasp possibly the, uh, the last chance. Um, I have yet to meet a council who actually wants development on Middlewick, which puzzles me as to how therefore it's actually in the local plan. Um, it's one of those great mysteries, but let us start afresh from now, because I think I'm going to ask the cabinet to seize this opportunity, because a week ago, the prime minister said this, to build the homes that young families need in this country, not on green fields, not just jammed in the southeast, but beautiful homes on brownfield sites. Middlewick is more than just green fields. It is very special, as the Essex Wildlife Trust and the Colchester Natural History Society will tell you. So, and we are actually in the southeast when it comes to um, government description, because 
Essex is part of the Southeast Local Enterprise Partnership. So my suggestion, Chairman, is that you, the Cabinet, write to the Prime Minister, ask him to come to Colchester, because this isn't just any old green fields, these are green fields owned by the government. And therefore, this would be an opportunity for the Prime Minister to prove that when he said, we will not build on green fields, that he meant what he said. And I think it's an open invitation for him, for you to invite him to come here so that he can actually say, I meant what I said, Middlewick will not be built on. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sir Bob. Uh, Councillor Ellis, is there anything you wish to add on this item since it's your portfolio? Um, I actually need to go back and have a listen to the speech, um, Sir Bob, because I brought this up today in a briefing, um, thinking that um, Boris, having said um, not building on green fields might be an opportunity for us, but um, I, I'm told that those weren't his exact words. Those were the words that were reported, um, but they weren't his exact words. His, um, and I'm unsure whether he meant green fields or green belt, although as the previous mayor of London, I would have thought he would understand what green belt meant. Um, so it, it's a confusion. Um, Middlewick, Middlewick's a really difficult one, you know, because you and I have spoken about it in the past on several occasions. We've met and discussed the, the Middlewick conundrum. Um, it was put in the local plan, not by this administration, but by a previous administration. However, we're now in a situation where the inspector has come back with his modifications. They've gone through the local plan committee. They've now gone out to consultation um, on those modifications. And actually, I think he's made life particularly difficult in those modifications for anyone that wishes to develop at Middlewick. Now, if we decide we, want to, we wanted to remove Middlewick from the plan, we will, you'd effectively blow up the plan as it stands because we've already agreed 920 houses as a council. Um, 920 houses can be built per year in Colchester. If you remove Middlewick, you won't be able to meet the target of 920 houses per year in Colchester, as, as I understand it at the moment. And removing Middlewick, there's, there's no mechanism for just taking that out of the plan. There's a mechanism at the moment for members and for um, members of the public to respond to the inspector's modifications on the plan. From a personal perspective, I think they're probably the best opportunity for us to reopen the door with the DIO and have a discussion about Middlewick. Um, but, but as for writing to the Prime Minister, I'd probably have to defer to the leader to decide whether he wants to write to the Prime Minister and ask him to visit Colchester and look at, and look at Middlewick itself. It, it's, a, it's an incredibly complicated conundrum, and as you and I both know. We, I remember, as I've said on uh, here before, I remember walking on Middlewick and enjoying Middlewick as a youngster, you know, from, I, I've lived here all my life. Um, it's not somewhere, personally, I would like to see uh, development on. If I could do something to stop development on Middlewick, I, I would probably do so. But as it stands, for me to do that would probably mean blowing up the local plan. And whilst it would be it would be wonderful to remove the development from Middlewick. What the ramifications of blowing up the plan means that we could then have planning by appeal. We might find that we actually have more development on Middlewick than is in the local plan. And we may find that we have, um, we will have unwelcome development, well, we would find that we have unwelcome development elsewhere in the borough. That's the conundrum that we're trying to grasp at the moment. And, and actually, I was rather pleased when I read the as pleased as one could be when I read the inspector's um, modifications because I thought he'd made it incredibly restrictive for developing the WIC and it gave us a lot of opportunities to re-explore the biodiversity issues which you and I know probably weren't considered properly or, or fully when we first as a local plan panel looked at Middlewick. Um, I think that's that that he has given us the opportunity to do far more 
on that, which may, may find that there are rather larger constraints on development in Middlewick than were previously thought when the, when the site was first brought forward. Does that make sense? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ellis. I think Councillor Lissy Moore just wants to come in. Yes, sorry. I just it was uh, really coming back to the idea of uh, inviting the Prime Minister to Colchester. Of course, he'd be very, very welcome. But um, it reminded me that a statement had come out from our MP Will Quince, um, and it does say on the statement that he has very recently written to the Secretary of State for Defence to ask for a meeting to discuss the importance of retaining the land in light of the Prime Minister's Conservative Party conference speech and his comments on development. And he's also written recently to the Secretary of State for levelling up housing in communities, requesting a meeting to discuss the importance of protecting from development this cherished green space within the Colchester community. That is just two items of a very, very long list that um, Mr. Quince has, has made a statement of saying, you know, this is what I have done and this is what I'm doing for the future. So I think we need to see what the um, discussions, how they um, pan out. Um, with the relevant uh, ministers there. Um, but I, I think our, our way through with this is through our MP. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. So, well, yeah, yeah, just to add to that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm always happy to invite the Prime Minister to Colchester. Um, I think it's perhaps a case of timing as well. Um, I will be following well, uh, this authority, and I'm sure all other local authorities will be following with interest um, what detailed policy develops from the Prime Minister's statement. Um, I think that is where we'll, we'll really find out uh, uh, what it means. Um, and I think we will uh, uh, act accordingly to the, the best benefits of, of trying to stop development on Middlewick. I think it's the best table. If you want to come back briefly, Sir Bob. Very briefly, Chair, I'd like to thank the three responses which I thought were encouraging. So thank you to all three. Um, I, I have written to the Prime Minister, so if I can write, I'm sure others can as well. Um, but the Prime Minister, I've got the whole, whole of his speech. It was not a slip of the tongue. He is actually written down green fields, actually not on green fields, so it's quite clear. But I do appreciate the three responses and let's hope that from that will flow a decision one way or another to prevent any development on Middlewick, and I'm most grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and our next Have Your Say speaker is Catherine Spindler. Uh, you have uh, three minutes. The bell will sound after two. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> the last two years have been really hard for our young people of Colchester. It's been extremely tough, and our child, our for, and for any child prevented from seeing friends and family, from going to school, in fact, from any interactions has been a long-term consequence, so future holds many uncertainties. Now is the time to provide real support, real help and reassurance to our youth that do care and that they matter to us all in the, for this town's future. But they are our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, who for too long have had support for them cut whilst demands on them have risen. A youth zone will be a good long way to help support and direct these young people, to steer them away from gangs and county lines, <clears throat> to set them to a path to future careers and provide physical and mental support Residents of culture passionately want this for their youngsters. So as a council of any party, this must be the top of the agenda to be a cross party commitment to support young people's future. I am therefore asking for a meeting with relevant cabinet member and council officers alongside councillor Phil Coleman, who has extensive knowledge of facilities, their benefits and important funding opportunities. As a matter of urgency, we cannot fail this generation together, we can deliver for them. I feel I have a prime location that can be considered and I look forward to discussing all possibilities with the forthcoming meeting. <clears throat> I am fortunate enough to have nine grandchildren, 
10 children and so many children that consider my home to be theirs too. One of these, I was blessed to have the opportunity to attend their wedding in this building today. You are a handful of people that hold the key to the future of thousands of children's lives, giving their young minds the opportunity to go forward to all the exciting challenges that will give them memories they will take with them to the positive and rewarding road ahead. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you. I think Councillor Lissamore is going to come back on this first. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much for coming here th this evening. Um, you missed, unless you were watching on, on uh, YouTube last night, a two, three hour debate that we had at the scrutiny panel meeting on uh, the youth zone and the elements of the funding. Um, but how I want to sort of respond to you as uh, the former chair of the Colchester Youth Strategy Group, which uh, I held the position for about six, seven years. And I can say that Councillor Lewis Barber, who is here tonight, is uh, now the chair of that youth strategy group. Um, the youth strategy group has funding from Essex County Council and decides um, with the help of young people from the area on the, uh, the way that money is spent. Um, it has been highly successful in my view in the last few years in not only spending the money that Essex County Council has given them, but getting extra uh, money from other organisations such as Colchester Borough Council, such as First Sight, such as Colchester United Football Club, and it continues to thrive. Now, um, I, I will say this, and I said it last night at scrutiny, it would be nice, however, if councillors actually turned up for the meeting. And I know you belong to a p particular political party, can I please ask you when you have a meeting with your colleagues, please remind them to come to the meetings. Um, I know we've had new county councillors come in since May, um, but it, it does help so that they can be kept updated with what is actually happening. And when um, they will mention at meetings that the youth service is unfunded and this isn't happening and that isn't happening, I do remind them that this is happening and that is happening um, because we talk about it at the youth strategy group and we fund it at the youth strategy group. So that would be my suggestion at the moment. Please talk to your colleagues. Please implore them to, to come to the youth strategy group so they can see what is actually happening within the town. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, I just would like to reply that I'm here as a resident, my party preference doesn't come into it and I did ask for it to be a united thing between all the parties, um, but yes, it would be so nice if we could just lay down our political thoughts and get on with the job, which would be wonderful. Yes. <laughs> I, yes, I totally agree with you there. And as was discussed at the scrutiny meeting last night, um, and will I'm sure be discussed later on here tonight, this there is a, a cross-party belief in a youth zone. However, the funding is not in place. And until we have a united front on where the money is coming from, and this is not, this is the building costs, and this is the revenue running costs year upon year upon year and a site. And until we all as councillors from all political parties can come up with the re an answer to all those three questions, we are going to find it very, very difficult to build a youth zone in Colchester. So we are working forward on that. So thank you very much for oh, coming thank tonight. You, thank you for that. I just will say that this is brief. Um, yeah. Phil Coleman has got all the necessary information that you need, and I will pass on the relevant uh, opportunity that may be for building on as well to him, if you would like to have that talk with him. I understand possibly that's yeah. something you'd prefer to do with councillors only. Thank we'll, you very much. We'll, we'll, we'll certainly look at all options. Just, I mean, just to add to that, um, coming out of the scrutiny panel last night, there is a recommendation which I think we will be uh, mainly accepting, which is going to attempt to uh, 
get together with the subcommittee to, to see if they can uh, find a way through the maze, to, if you like. But I think I'm down to three options because the, 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 the reality is we do have finite resources at the end of the day. We have a finite income and budget. And it is the revenue cost, the cost per year, which are going to be going on for the next 10 or 20 years because there's no point in building it and closing it after two years because we can't afford it. Um, and to afford, to afford it, they will have to, the three options are really to, to stop doing something we do as a council at the moment. And that may well mean stopping helping or reducing help we currently give to people. Um, it may mean raising our income, which in a practical level can only mean raising council tax, which will probably require a referendum. So it would require all parties to buy into that and it to be won uh, amongst the people of Colchester. Or we charge for a service or something which we do not currently charge for. I can't actually see that there is any other way around it other than one of those or a combination across those three because uh, as the chief financial officer made very clear last night at the moment we haven't got the money spare so obviously it'll be interesting to see what that cross party and i hope they do work in a genuine cross party friendly manner which out of those options they they, they come up with but being absolutely honest with you and i'm completely sold on the idea of a youth zone myself um it's going to come down to one of those three options thank you for your time thank you I think that completes the have your say under the general have your say, does it? I believe so. It completes the public have your it say. It does complete the, the public. Chairman, but there are say. some uh, councillors. I beg your pardon? Yes, they are not under the item, they are under public have your say. Yes, so councillors, uh, we have councillor Pam Cox, who is joining us remotely. Yes, good evening. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's a follow-up uh, uh, to my um, question that I raised at um, a recent meeting on the 21st of um, September at the Local Plan Committee. Um, uh, Councillor Dundas, you gave a very encouraging response to the question that I raised that on that evening about the future of the Avro site. Um, and I wondered uh, if Cabinet can confirm that CBC is conducting or is planning to conduct the feasibility study into the possible purchase of the Avro site. And if if uh, possible, what are the time scales for that? And of course, the Abro site neighbours the uh, unique Roman circus, um, which would connect to uh, Dorian's point about city bid as well, I think. Second question is, uh, and there was a further encouraging response from officers at that meeting on the 21st of September to on the same matter of adding um, an SPD, uh, Supplementary Plan for Development, to the current development brief for the site. So I'm asking, can Cabinet allocate resource for that and set a target timescale for commencement of the work on that SPD? Because that would give the Council greater control over the development of what is really a crucial um, town centre site for us. And if I may sneak in at one third one, um, which has uh, arisen since um, I, I submitted these, these two questions to Richard Clifford. Um, I wonder if you could give me an update on the Gosbex feasibility plan. Um, which uh, I, I gather was completed last, um, last spring, just before a pandemic. Um, it seemed to me to be some, have some really interesting options for the development of Gosbex, which is obviously the, the field that which, uh, not just any green field, as Sir Bob might say, but the field which saw the founding of Roman Britain, which I really do think we could do more with. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And also, um, Thank you for submitting the, 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 the first part of your question um, in advance. Um, on, uh, I'll deal, deal with it in two separate things. On, on, on the purchase of the site, um, we do know that the site has now gone onto the open market. Um, we are updating, we did do a viability study uh, a number of years ago on it. We are updating that with a view to, to work out uh, what we think the correct financial position is. The bidding, I was told the bidding closed on November the 2nd. I believe that's been extended to November the 9th. I think we, we heard earlier this evening. Um, and, you know, we're considering the right amount to, amount to bid and uh, hopefully we plan to do so. I, I can talk the detailed financials, but it would have to be either in confidential session 
or on a one-to-one -one basis. So um, you, you, we are, we will go into confidential um, session at the end of this meeting. You, you are welcome to wait till then, in which case I'm happy to elaborate a little bit more, um, or I'm happy to suggest to officers that we um, perhaps set up a, a brief meeting on a confidential basis, and I'm, I'll happily talk about it to you in a little bit more detail. On the SBD, I'm gonna to defer to the portfolio holder, Councillor Ellis. Thank you, um, Leader, and, and I think a, a, some cross-party work on this would be really sensible given the, um, the, the financials involved and the risks involved so that we all understand where we are, but, but yeah. Um, SPD-wise, um, that is going to go out to, officers are as good as their word, that is going to go out to consultation uh, on the 15th of October. Um, okay so that it can come back to the local plan committee uh, on the 13th of December. Um, so they are, they are acting speedily. Um, the issue we've obviously got is the SBD is going to, will, will come back after bids have closed on the, um, for the site, uh, which is somewhat frustrating. Uh, so what we will do is make sure that the, um, the selling agent is aware that there's an SBD and I think we'll We'll see if we can't do a little bit more publicity around the fact that there is going to be uh, the, the development brief effectively, which the local plan committee went through as a draft, um, will um, be, is being worked into an SPD, therefore it will be important um, as a planning document and any potential bidder uh, should be cognizant of, of what they will be being asked to do uh, within the SPD, therefore um, they won't be able to, if if we were to bid, and if we weren't successful but someone um, bid rather more, um, they would know, we know what we're going to have to do to the site, they're going to have to do exactly the same, so they're going to have to understand what we will be expecting of them in policy terms um, with that SPD. Um, it's, it's absolutely vital that they understand that before they, um, before they make bids, because what they won't be able to do, given that we have an SPD, is come back and say they can't afford to provide the affordable housing or what, or what have you, um, because they didn't know they were going to have to do it. They will be fully cognizant of that fact before they bid for the site. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. On, on the GOSPEX feasibility plan, that is not something I'm immediately familiar with. Um, Councillor Laws. Hi, Councillor Cox. I don't know if there's a particular aspect of that feasibility study that um, you, you were keen on. Um, there's certainly some very good content in there. Uh, there. There isn't any immediate plans, any immediate budget lines to do anything there. Um, but the feasibility study did outline what could be done. Um, the the long-held view of me is that you know we should look to a point where we can have an experience there that's not too dissimilar from going to Sutton Hoo, where you are able to walk around and potentially at the end of your your walk um, use some facilities and, and, and get some coffee. And I, I think that that's a um, a fair long-term aspiration. Uh, the last time I checked in on this, the Shrub End ward councillors were um, under consideration of what potential Section 106 contributions could be used to, to enhance the interpretation there because obviously as you all know there is some new build properties happening there as we speak but I think you know we all know in the very short term the car park needs to be potentially extended um, there needs to be greater interpretation uh, an immediate larger set of signage there to explain what is there and what was there uh, and in the long run I'm hope that we can find consensus in this building to ensure that we do more than we've done over the last 20, 30 years to, to greater enhance the interpretation of it. It is the reason, of course, why the Romans came to Colchester, that site, mm -hmm. uh, and it's the reason that we're, we're sat in this room tonight. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Lawson. Uh, uh, Councillor Cox, I, I hope that, that helps a bit. As I say, I'm sorry I can't go into more detail, but I'm sure, as, as you'll appreciate, we, I don't want to jeopardise anything by talking about commercially sensitive things in public at this stage. Um, is that helpful? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I would take up that offer if that still stands of, of, a, of, a, of a meeting with you on that, because uh, I'm you know, particularly interested in that, and it's in my ward as well. I had a long chat with Philip Crummy from the Archaeological Trust about it as well. Uh, so if that would suit, I would, that would, I would welcome that. And I think um, Council Laws is absolutely right about Gosbex. You know, Runnymede has Magna Carta, you know, Colchester has the founding site of Roman Britain, but there's not even a single road sign to it. 
and, and I wasn't even aware of it until about 15 years ago, having lived here for a long time. So. Thank yeah. you. I, I will ask officers to set that meeting up. I see them nodding, so um, we can consider that that, that ask. Um, our next speaker is Councillor Mark Gocher. Councillor Gocher. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Leader. Thank you. Um, I've got um, four quick issues. Firstly, um, Sir Bob Russell has already made the first um, point that I was going to make about Middlewick. Um, I did listen to most of the Prime Minister's speech um, and the words were quite clear. He got the headlines he wanted in the Daily Telegraph and elsewhere, no building on green fields. I thought it was very welcome, very positive, um, and I just think that we shouldn't lift, um, um, look a gift horse in the mouth in terms of any opportunity. My second issue concerns bins. Um, this came up in the policy panel meeting. Um, where um, it was presented as a bin audit would take place with a looking at uh, rationalising the type of bin that is provided in our wards. Um, but since then, I've been hearing concerning reports from other councillors that bins are disappearing, um, being removed, often for the reason that um, there's fly tipping nearby and therefore the solution is to remove the bin permanently, which seems like a, a ridiculous solution. So can you clarify, please, what is actually happening with our bins and um, whether or not this bin audit is actually a disguised bin cut, because that's what we don't want in our wards. Um, third issue, um, the Civic Society has raised with me, or members of the Civic Society have raised with me the issue of the tarmac patches that exist all over um, central Colchester and, and parts of my ward. Um, I know that's Essex County Council and Essex Highways, um, but what are we doing? Um, I know that, that some of you will have very positive links with, with um, the County Council. So what are we doing um, to ask the question of why this is happening um, in, in an increasingly frequent way? There's another patch just gone down outside the Magistrates Court. Um, and, um, you know, why are they just tarmacking over um, areas that should have paving stones and removing the stones? And the fourth issue I have um, is to do with glyphosate spraying by Colchester Borough Homes. Um, the previous um, cabinet um, said that glyphosate spraying by the Borough Council would stop in March 2021, and yet I've been informed that Colchester Borough Homes are still doing it. And uh, um, people have asked me to raise why that is happening and why um, subsidiaries of Colchester Borough Council are still doing it when the ban was supposed to have come in place. Um, finally, just on Gospex, I visited Gospex in the summer um, and the lines um, um, earmarking the key parts of the site um, had, fa had faded to nothing and one of the signs had gone to absolute nothing. So anything you could do about that to improve it, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Gocha. On, um, on bins, I think that comes, is that, that's Councillor Crow's uh, portfolio. Just to explain, um, Councillor Crow, um, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, um, has unfortunately been taken to A&E uh, into hospital. Um, so um, was going to attend, but we didn't know until about half past five. So obviously we wish him well. But I think Councillor Laws is going to come in. Just, just if it's helpful, um, I have to be honest, bin talk has never been the reason why I got involved in, in, in this business. Um, it doesn't really excite me, but it's an important function. Um, I, no doubt um, Councillor Crow can, can share in writing to you what's been going on. Um, I've been privy to some of the conversations and have, have input a little bit because I, I've been very cognizant that um, you can't take a blanket approach to bins. Um, there, are, there are key places in, for example, the town centre where you need to have, a, I think, a design guide um, and I was a bit um, uh, annoyed, and it's the first time I've ever said this, I was a bit annoyed when um, Councillor Goss got a bit trigger happy with putting bins all over the high street that, in my opinion, aren't necessarily as sympathetic as some of the older cast iron ones. But that said, um, in, in the previous administration's defence, those cast iron ones do cost considerably more. Um, so we as a cabinet are cognizant that des design of bins matters. And we are also conscious of location. I'll give you one example of um, a bin in my ward that I just think it's worth considering this in, in the realm but in Dedham on the bridge there was a bin and it was con continuously overflowing continuously to a point where it just couldn't kept, be kept on, on top of uh, and rubbish and plastic was falling into the river uh, and we know that animals were put down because they had so much plastic in their stomachs um, aside from the fact that it looks disgusting um, and it was a real problem 
Uh, and so the, 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 the view amongst the parish councillors and the ward councillors was that actually the removal of that bin would alter uh, a change in habits of people and they'd be encouraged, rather forced, to take their rubbish home and bin liners would not fall into the river. And that happened. So um, uh, I'm, I'm sure that nothing sinister is going on with a wholesale bin cut, but where there is logic in, in potentially removing a bin, I think that we should be open-minded to the concept of it, particularly around water. Um, open top bins for me, even, even through the colon that runs through the centre by um, off North Station Road, they concern me because on a windy day things can blow out. So I think it's an important conversation to be had uh, and, I, and I'm sure Councillor Crow can fill you in on the detail and reassure you that there is no bin cut as such for cut's sake. If that's helpful. Thank you, Councillor Laws. Councillor Oxford. Um, I'm afraid I'm getting a bit confused again because I thought bins was me. Um, I've had, I've got a. You may a well, you may well be right. I was just yeah. taking what somebody said. I, I think, I think it's probably me because I've got a question from Councillor Goss about bins as well. Um, he says that he's been. Uh, uh, inundated with angry councillors and residents complaining. Well, um, no one has complained to me at all. Uh, so I don't know where all these people are, but some of the bins that have been removed, there were notices put on so residents would know parish councils were involved uh, in the removal of some of these bins. And one of the reasons why some of them have been gone is because of continual fly tipping. Uh, people ha now have got it into their heads that they will put stuff that shouldn't go in an ordinary litter bin, like sometimes their own black bag because they've missed it. They'll put it in an ordinary litter bin, therefore it overflows or people can't put the litter in that should be in there in the first place. So notices were put out that if this carried on, the bin would be taken away, not permanently. And we have a bin policy coming. Um, the panel has looked at it and it will be coming to cabinet next month. Some bins have been removed because they are no longer fit for purpose. Uh, there is uh, one bin that uh, was made of wood uh, and it's slowly crumbling away. So that's been taken away and will be replaced. Uh, some of the open top bins, the concrete type ones. Um, they're also no longer fit for purpose because they're so old. So um, they are being removed and hopefully will be replaced. But it comes down again to the public using things that they shouldn't be using them for because they're too lazy to do it in the proper way. Um, and it, it just means that our teams have to spend a lot more time clearing up stuff that basically they shouldn't be clearing up when they could be using their time in a lot more productive way. Uh, but parish councils were informed, notices were put up to say, if this fly tipping carries on, these bins will be removed for now. Um, and I haven't had anybody complain to me. I don't know if you want to get in touch with Councillor Goss because he had a long email, and I got it here, sent to him on the 8th of October, explaining everything. Uh, so I don't know if you want to talk to him about it, if that helps. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Oxford. And I blame Councillor Laws for the confusion over uh, portfolios. He gets a demerit this evening. Um, Councillor Lissimore, you want to come in as well. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the highways piece. Obviously, yes, you're right. This is an Essex County Council function and not a Colchester Borough Council function. However, with my other hat on as Deputy Cabinet Member for Highways, um, I have I know the the uh, areas that, that you're talking about and I have seen pictures of the remedial work that has been done to replace the blocks in certain places. On occasions, um, a, a temporary filling has to be put in to allow the ground to settle um, until the permanent uh, fix can be made. Um, but there are some that have gone on too long. My suggestion to you is to speak to your county councillor um, to ensure that he knows uh, of, of the areas that you're describing. He has, each county councillor has a dedicated, dedicated highways engineer 
so he can go to his own dedicated engineer and ask for updates on those particular points. So uh, please speak to him. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Ellis, I think. On the glyphosate issue, um, Leader, yeah, uh, I can confirm they have used some glyphosate. They've, um, they're no longer using glyphosate um, on uh, mowing margins around buildings or lamp posts or fence posts, but they have, it has been used on uh, hard standings. Uh, they're working with the council uh, to phase that out, and it will be phased out by um, April. Um, Okay, so I think it's it's residual stocks, which may also have been the council's residual stocks. I don't know, but that that's where they are. They're not using it on on any of the mowing margins. It has just been on hard standings, and and they are phasing it. They're working to phase it out now by April. Okay. Thank you, councillors. I, I know this came up at scrutiny last night uh, when reviewing the, the CBH performance and. Um, the CB, CBH gave substantial, the same answers, Councillor Ellis, but a lot longer, which I'm not going to try and repeat because I can't remember it all, but it did amount to, to, to the same thing. So I hope that answers some or all of your points, Councillor Gocha. Thank you. I just want to um, formally wish Councillor Crow a speedy recovery. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll pass, that, pass that on. Um, our next speaker is uh, well, it's councillor martin goss uh, and i understand that a statement is going to be read by the monitoring officer yes thank you leader the following is a statement and two questions from uh, councillor goss i am highly disappointed that i've asked questions at the last two cabinet meetings which are both recorded and minuted and yet despite promises at the last meeting that i would get a written response to my repeated questions absolutely nothing has been forthcoming this simply isn't acceptable and it is at best utterly incompetent by the council so please get me a response all points are minuted in two sets of minutes now to my new points and questions <clears throat> the high street pavement cleanliness is absolutely abysmal the pavements are dirty and stained i didn't hand across pavements in this state in may but their condition since then has continued to deteriorate. Why are you not cleaning them properly? You should be ashamed of the current state of Colchester. The new paving grout in the high street is also crumbling. Colchester paid 120,000 towards getting Essex highways to relay and regrout the entire high street. The supplier is supposed to come back and remediate all issues and yet it hasn't happened. I have raised it with the portfolio holder at Essex, who gives me dates which then don't get met. Cabinet in Colchester is ignoring the, the issue. What will you do about it, please? Secondly, why are you removing little, litter bins in various wards in Colchester without any consultation or agreement with ward councillors? This has come up on social media and residents are really angry. This isn't acceptable. Again, doing things residents do not want or agree with. All bins need to be replaced or put in places agreed with local councillors. The new proposed litter bin policy isn't yet adopted or agreed, so you are carrying out work via an unapproved and unadopted policy. When will these bins be replaced, please, and why are councillors being ignored? That's the end of Councillor Goss's questions. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think the bins thing's already been answered, but Councillor Oxford is going to answer some more. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Goss. Um, I find your language is disgraceful, actually. Uh, to use the word abysmal uh, is not fair, but it's not fair to our dedicated staff that work hard every day, all day, making sure our ten centre is as good as that can be. Uh, also, the cleaning regime has not been changed since you were portfolio holder. So, if it is abysmal now, it was abysmal then. Uh, also, for your information, um, Samantha Lancaster and Rosa Tanfield went on a walkabout in the town centre yesterday um, and the only staining there is uh, on the path is uh, two places 
they are going to be uh, served with what's called a community protection warning for them to clear it up. And uh, Samantha Lancaster is going to go back tomorrow to make sure it is being done. Uh, the litter picking takes place from half past seven in the morning till gone eight o'clock at night, every day. The town centre is cleaned, pressure washed every day. I have been there, I have seen it for myself. I really do think, Councillor Goss, you need to think about the sort of language you use because this is demoralizing for the staff that do it and I have spoken to them and they do feel demoralized and unloved when people keep saying filthy town centre filthy it's disgusting it's disgraceful when actually it isn't and they know it isn't because they do it also we have regular action days uh, in the town centre I've been on one uh, been painting and railings and whatever. So the action days are taking place where more litter is collected. Weeds are cleared, painting is done, tidying up is done. So to, to say that nothing is ever done in the town centre is just completely wrong. Um, and also the grouting is obviously highways. It isn't actually us. And I think I have covered the uh, bin uh, question uh, by uh, Councillor Gocha. So I think that is uh, enough from me. But please, will you moderate your language and think before you use these sorts of words? They are very hurtful and very dispiriting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Oxford. Councillor Lissimore. I felt very uncomfortable and I would like to apologise to Andrew Weavers for having to read that out to i don't know the reason why councillor goss isn't here tonight we, we all have our moments when we cannot be at meetings and i absolutely accept that but to put a statement in with language like that then have to get an officer to read it out is is very very unfair i'm sorry mr weavers that you had to sit and read that out and i feel i felt very very uncomfortable for you when, when you did, so I apologise for that. I just wanted to add to anyone who's listening to this or anyone who's here in, in the town hall, the reason the grouting was removed, was missing from the pavement was because of a machine that was used by Colchester Borough Council. That is why Colchester Borough Council had to pay Essex County Council to remedy it. Um, now, I cannot remember the time that machine was ordered, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was under um, Councillor Goss's watch as well as the portfolio holder. So that is the reason why the grouting was missing in the first place. But I'm sorry, Mr. Weavers, that you had to read that and I found that very, very uncomfortable. Thank you, Councillor Lissimore. Well, yeah, just, just to follow up and, and personally endorse uh, Councillor Oxford's comments about the, uh, the, the action day. I think, I think myself, Councillor Oxford and Councillor Lissimore, we, we managed a remarkable achievement of getting more paint on the railings than ourselves, which was an unusual ratio, but I was quite pleased about that. And also on, on, the, on the town centre, um, I, I was in the town centre early Monday morning having a tour around the town deal sites, and I don't recognise what Councillor Goss has said at all. In fact, what was encouraging was how good it's looking um, and also how busy it was. You know, 9.30 on a cold Monday morning, it was busy. There are very few vacancies in the town centre at the moment with the shops and those which are vacant, I understand, in most cases have already been let. Um, so I actually think our town centre, certainly in comparison to other town centres I visit, is looking good and, and doing remarkably well uh, post-COVID, but um, that's my view. On the written answers, I will ask the monitoring officer to check um, what responses have been given. Obviously, if we have missed, for whatever reason, a reply, I'm sure he will make sure that Councillor Goss is provided with one promptly. Okay. On that subject, unless anybody's got anything else to say, we'll move on. And our, our next uh, have your say is Councillor Jay Young, who is joining us remotely. Good evening. Um, good evening, Leader. I've got two um, quick points and then a question, if I may. So um, really encouraging news on the situation regarding the Abro site. I'm really glad 
to see that you're progressing the ideas that were developed in the local plan committee in terms of the SPD and potentially um, the purchase of the site, which was a recommendation from the local plan committee. Um, the second point is to um, build on and agree with what Dorian Kelly said about um, provision for grassroots arts funding. It's something that um, I did in the year 2020. And although um, some of those um, people that were lucky enough to get some of that grassroots roots funding um, sort of had to delay that to um, subsequent years because of COVID. It just shows if you look at the uh, Colchester Free Festival, which got a very small pot of money actually from the Borough Council, but from that small pot of money was able to attract Arts Council funding. Um, and that event will be happening, um, I think it's on the 21st of October that starts. So a really you know, good example of how small pots of money actually bring in um, great benefit. And, and obviously I support the continuation of funding for the MPO organisations. But my main point leader is about um, safety in our streets. Um, none of us can be, um, uh, well, we can all be uh, reflective on the shocking um, outcome of the Sarah Everard case. Um, but um, I know Councillor Lissimore will know about this issue and I know it was an issue that we talked about um, in the five aside meetings when I was in the administration. And we were making some progress on uh, the situation in Lightship Way. Um, so none of the street lights are working on Quayside there. Um, and um, the uh, condition of the footwell, footway there um, it, it, it is um, of a dangerous state. And I know Councillor Lissimore knows about that because it's something she's mentioned to me in the past. Um, it needs to be resolved. Um, and we were having discussions in five or five meetings, but you know, with the Sarah Everard situation sharp in our minds, uh, we do need to get street lights back on in that locality um, and get that um, highway brought up to a good standard to make sure it's safe for people, but also lead uh, um, to consider more widely our responsibility uh, for women's safety in our streets of Colchester, because I know we weren't successful uh, with the bid to government for safer streets funding. And I wondered what plans uh, the administration had got to deal with that in the light of not getting that money. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Councillor Young. Um, would anybody like to come in on that? Uh, Councillor Simmel? Right. As I was mentioned, um, just to say that um, I will ask the officers to get an update on Colchester Borough Council's position with regard to the pavement and street lighting there. Um, it was highlighted to me a number of years ago by a resident who'd gone for a walk down there and, and wasn't happy, obviously, with the state of the pavement. Um, and I remember at the time, you know, it came back that the land um, the company that owned the land had gone bust at the time, so it's not actually highways land. But as I say, that was a number of years ago, and I have not had any updates since on, on, on that. So uh, if it can be noted by the officers um, of any Colchester Borough Council's involvement, um, otherwise I suggest that Councillor Young speaks to um, her county councillor, which is a bit ironic, um, to um, get an update from highways and from the local highways engineer. Yeah, thank you. Just to add to that, I, I do know actually that Lightship Way is on the agenda for the next Fiberside meeting. Actually, so so it is certainly there. Um, I'll also add on the on, on, on the safer streets. Um, we've also, as Councillor Young will be aware, uh, I'm sure she'll welcome that we've put in the bid for I think it's just over half a million pounds for CCT coverage of many areas of Grinstead. Um, that's looking quite good. And we're, we're, we're really hopeful and positive that that will be forthcoming um, quite quickly, which I know uh, she, she will welcome. Councillor Young, is there anything you just want to come back on briefly? Um, yeah, I will keep it brief. Um, I'm glad to hear that it is still being discussed in the five-a-side meetings, Leader, because we were 
uh, the last time I was present in a meeting, there was a, um, we were waiting on sort of survey results and Rob McDonald was working on that. Um, but it just seems to, there hasn't been any updates since sort of May time. Obviously, I'm not aware of what your discussions are anymore. Uh, but it is an issue that needs resolving. And I'm obviously pleased to hear that there's some, some funding being applied for, for um, CCTV in Greenstead. Do we, do we have a date when we might know when that has been successful or not? Um, I haven't off the top of my head. I understood it was hopefully going to be quite a quick turnaround. So um, I will chase up officers to see if we've heard anything. But I, I was hoping to hear a, a positive outcome uh, fairly quickly on that. Um, yeah, just on Lightship Way, yeah, as, as you know, it's, um, it, it's a long running and complicated um, story, but uh, rest assured, certainly the, the five side meeting will, will be keeping the pressure up because I, I do agree that a resolution is needed. Um, if that's everything, we'll move on. Uh, the next speaker is, oh, thank you, Councillor Young, uh, is Councillor Dennis Willits, who is here in person. Yes, he is. Uh, good evening, Leader. Uh, can I address you on the, the matter of defibrillators uh, in the borough? Um, I'm uh, acutely aware of my uh, uh, relative advancing years and the fact that I run up the stairs from the Conservative group room to the Moot Hall three times in the hour preceding the, uh, the start of Cabinet, so it's always good to know where the nearest defibrillator is. Uh, I belong to the Rotary Club of Colchester, um, our motto, good food and even better charitable works. Uh, and we have a, a project to buy and install defibrillators wherever the opportunity arises uh, in all quarters of the borough, um, from the, uh, the rugby club in the north down to uh, uh, sites in the, uh, uh, elsewhere in the borough. Uh, we recently considered uh, installing a defibrillator in Crouch Street because we we're aware that um, that is an area where there was not a, um, a unit within, uh, within easy reach according to the, um, the guidelines. Uh, we uh, agreed a site with um, uh, a, an owner of a building in Crouch Street because you do need electricity as well as the owner's permission uh, in a little niche which was uh, very convenient uh, in this building and things looked well. Uh, but I thought perhaps we should just check with the planning department that it was okay to, to put it there before I got out my electric drill and posi drive and, uh, and connected it up. And the statement coming back from the planning, uh, chief planning officer was that number X Crouch Street is a grade two listed building and listed building consent will consequently be required. In addition, in terms of planning permission, there is currently no category of permitted development for defibrillators. And I'm sorry to say, but technically that means planning permission is also required for your defibrillator. Um, the planning officer considers, continues, it seems silly, I agree, that more major matters could be carried out, um, uh, but etc., um, etc. cetera, et cetera. Um, so what I would like to, to do this evening, Leader, is firstly raise the issue of, um, of defibrillators in listed, uh, on listed buildings and conservation areas uh, and suggest that um, the portfolio holder for planning should perhaps seek um, government's inclusion of defibrillators um, into those permitted developments so that we don't have to apply for planning permission um, to, to put one in. And, and secondly, uh, it does seem perverse that we, uh, we have to apply for listed building consent to put a defibrillator there. Uh, if that is so, I do wonder whether the council would be prepared to waive the fees uh, for applying for planning permission and listed building consent for the defibrillator that the club is proposing to put uh, in, in, in Crouch Street. 
So can I leave that with you, leader? Your generosity would be much appreciated and a change to the planning rules, I think, would be helpful to the health of uh, those elderly persons thank like myself in the borough. Th thank, thank you, you. Councillor Willits. Firstly, can I say I'm pleased to hear that you're avoiding wear and tear on the Town Hall lift, because that, that, that's all good. Uh, Councillor Ellis, is there anything you wish to say on this item? Particularly, I'll... I'll I'll have a word with planning officers about it. I, I, I'll be honest, I wasn't aware you needed planning permit. Are you so, yeah, saying you need planning permission to install a defibrillator? Because I've seen them installed all over the borough. I've, I think, and various other councillors have given quite a lot of locality budget money for um, installing defibrillators um, across the borough. So I will, yeah, I'll definitely be looking into that on your behalf and I will come back to you, councillor. Um, and, and I agree, if we, if we do need to do so, we'll write to government and say we think it would be sensible to include those within PD. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Councillor Willits, is that of help? Uh, well, well, I was hoping to hear that you were going to waive the, the, um, the fees, but of course the problem was probably mine in that I asked the Chief Planning Officer, is it okay? And uh, I guess I should just have got out my drill and gone and done it, as others do. Uh, but I think we councillors must set a good example of obeying the rules. I did it properly, uh, and you, um, you see what happened, Leader. Thank you. I think I'll just have to say no comment uh, to that one. Uh, um, Councillor Barber is the next speaker. Thank you, Leader, and good evening, Cabinet. Uh, I'm uh, tending to make a financial plea, I'm afraid, uh, on you for an issue that uh, hit my inbox after the May election, as well as Councillor Law's inbox, as one of the first items that uh, we were queried on, uh, this being the access point to Northern Gateway from Langham and Boxford. Effectively, Northern Gateway has a design flaw in how it's been built in that access from uh, Lang and Boxton and of course further afield uh, via pedestrian routes and via cycling is uh, difficult slash impossible and very unsafe. Uh, it's something that the previous council leader, Councillor Corey, has acknowledged at the local highway panel, um, which Councillor Lismore uh, chairs when I raised this issue about whether highways can look into producing a feasibility study. Highways are prepared to do so and to make a funding contribution, but of course funding is limited. So um, there's only so far we can go. And I think it would ease the pressure, the budgetary pressure, if uh, this administration uh, re helped rectify the mistakes of the previous administration by making a small financial contribution to a feasibility study to explore how we can improve those links between uh, Northern Gateway and the rural areas in my county division. Uh, it would be a relatively small amount. We're probably looking about three to five thousand pounds uh, to spend depending on the scale of contribution from highways. I appreciate you may not be able to give a definitive answer tonight. However, I would be grateful if you can take this way and look into it. There are landowners who are interested in providing land for a scheme so i'm not asking you to financially contribute to a scheme at all i recognize that's within highways remit but I, I do think it would be a step in a good direction and contributing to improved relationships between the borough and county council in helping overcome this mistake by the previous administration thank you leader oh actually i can i just touch on uh, something that was raised about uh, the arts um councillor graham butler in the county full council yesterday uh, express his keenness to be involved and meet with small arts organisations, small cultural organisations, and I would encourage uh, borough councillors to get in touch with their county councillor as well to make sure they can contact Councillor Butland as well as raise it through Culture Borough Council too, because I think that's an area where there could be some really good working, and I fully support this administration's long-term funding settlement for the arts and culture. It's really important, not just because it makes our lives richer, but as Councillor Bentley has referred to before, it does have a knock on effect in a positive way on other services and, and is in real investment in improving people's lives and also reducing other budgetary pressures by putting in more long term uh, care for people effectively. It has that positive impact. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think Councillor Lissamore indicated to come in. Okay, thank you. As the Cabinet Member for Resources, um, I, I thank you for that. Um, I will do everything in my power to work with officers and work obviously with the with myself on as chair of the LHP to ensure that that goes ahead. So uh, thank you and I look forward to seeing the scheme. 
Thank you very much. I think that oh, Councillor Laws. Councillor Barber, can I thank you for bringing that to Cabinet's attention? Uh, as you know, I support the calls to, to do that. I, I cycled here today from Nayland, and I will cycle home tonight to Nayland, and I'm acutely aware of that, that, that physical barrier. Uh, when you're coming around Severals Lane, uh, you can't get to a cycle park. It seems ludicrous. It's most definitely an oversight by the previous administration, and I'm really hopeful um, that uh, through, through Councillor Lissamore's portfolio that we can... Um, make that right and put some money towards a feasibility study to uh, to re reconnect uh, the, the northern gateway cycle track to uh, the good people of langham boxford and even nayland and further afield as you say thank you lewis excellent excellent thank you very much thank you councillor barber i think that completes uh speakers under the general have your say item so we'll return to the agenda and the next agenda item is item six Decisions reviewed by the scrutiny panel. Uh, do we have any? There are none, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, then we'll move on to item seven, uh, which we, we do have some speakers. We have four speakers on this item. Um, would you like the speakers first or would you like to introduce the item? I'm going to introduce the item first, if that's all right, and then we'll take the speakers and I will respond individually to any points that the speakers raise. So, um, co colleagues, Cabinet, this is the collective effort of the Colchester to put in a bid for city status. Now, this is the fifth time that Colchester would have done this. The first time was in 1977 um, and we narrowly missed out. Uh, in, in the last application in, in 2012. Um, I've done a lot of deep thinking about this. And I, you know, I, I grew up in a village. I was born in a, in a, in a town. Um, I've traveled all over Europe and a little bit further afield to, to a multitude of different uh, destinations and have experienced those destinations uh, as someone working professionally as well as a, a, as a tourist. Um, the Romans came to Colchester in 43 AD. Uh, they came here because of what was here before. So as previous speakers have, have said, um, we have a, a history that goes back beyond 2000 years. But I think the key thing in all of this is that our urban history is around 2000 years. And in fact, when the Romans came here, they named this place Colonia Victrenesis, which means, or is believed to mean, the city of the victorious. And then in 1086, under the Doomsday Survey, Colchester was mentioned as one of the 12 settlements that was then a city. Now, our assets are numerous to list, and I'm going to list some of them because it's important. We have multiple train stations, an internationally renowned university, an internationally renowned zoo, Britain's only known Roman circus, Europe's largest castle Norman keep, Britain's oldest and longest three nationally funded organizations of significance. And we know, don't we, that First Sight is now the National Museum of the Year. Um, for me, I, I understand that a lot of this is intangible, that a lot of this is soft and it's a feeling. But for me, the recognition that you get with city status is the recognition of an urban center with a set of values. For me, the values are principally that we are open to business, that we are open to diversity. We are uh, very literally open to those fleeing from persecution. We've done that for hundreds of years. Long may that continue. Um, and that we're open to the future. And why should we sit in the shadow of Norwich City or Chelmsford City? Tourism could boom. We could be on the international tourist destination list. Um, I believe passionately that people, when they're thinking about weekends away, um, when they're flicking through the EasyJet catalogue, or perhaps they haven't done that for a couple of years, but they look for a city to go to, because cities are interesting places with lots of options and choice, and that's certainly what Colchester has. I also believe that the business benefits are going to be there at the moment. Colchester's economy is underpinned largely by small businesses, and perhaps actually we need to reach out and be a, a, an attractive destination for medium and larger businesses to consider, particularly in the context that many, many government departments and businesses in, this, in London are, are looking at their long-term options because it doesn't necessarily be that you have to be uh, in the city of London anymore with all the remote working uh, and agile working that we've got. Um, now we can, we can sit here and lament 
the loss of a, a, a cattle market at the bottom of North Hill or, or a bus station. But I'm afraid I don't believe that people choose to go to um, city destinations for a bus station or for a cattle market. Um, it, it's so much more than that. We have the A12, the ports, the airport, amazing coastline, a stone's throw from here. And, um, and, and it, for me, it's, it, the status is about a recognition of, of, of where we're at. Um, you know, we, 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 we go to university, or some of us do, and get degree certificates, and it means you can put letters after your name. And I think that, you know, that, that, that is a status, that's a recognition of your academic achievement. And um, wh why shouldn't Colchester be, be given the status of all that we've achieved here? Uh, I often think about uh, uh, one of my favorite films and a quote, you know, does making a man a knight make him a better fighter? Yes, it does. And let's fight for Colchester. Let's, 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 everyone who, who has any doubt about doing this, search deep, search deep, look into the future, look into what's going to happen with artificial intelligence, smart cities, the, the end to silo working, the end to nine to five. It could be really exciting. So I implore you to consider joining me, joining hopefully this room council, Will Quince MP, Sir Bernard Jenkins MP, Priti Patel MP, the Colchester Ambassadors, the Colchester Business Improvement District, the Garrison, the University of Lincoln, Destination, the University of Lincoln, University of Essex, Destination Colchester, and a whole host of others who are going to get behind this, hopefully, uh, and go out there and, and win, win the status that we deserve. Status. The Q, the, the, the Q, the clue is in the question. Do you want city status, status, prestige, recognition? Yes, I think we do. Colchester deserves it. Now is our time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Laws. Um, just before we go to the, the visiting speakers, just to be clear, uh, other airlines for city breaks are available, some of which haven't, some of which haven't pulled out of every Essex airport. Um, but we'll turn to the visiting councillors. Uh, Councillor Adam Fox. Uh, thank you very much, Leader. Good evening, um, Cabinet. Um, I wanted to come along um, this evening and talk to you about city status because I um, addressed uh, Cabinet um, earlier this year um, about it um, and want to place on record that I personally support a bid for, for city status um, for, um, for Colchester. Um, and as um, Councillor Laws has um, already plotted um, Colchester's um, uh, fantastic history, I won't go... Um, uh, into too much of it um, but I think since Colchester was made um, a, a colonia once the um, once the Romans um, settled here um, I think that it's only right that um, Colchester um, retains and is um, and is awarded its um, its rightful status as a city uh, in the um, in the United Kingdom um, but I raised before about the wider engagement with the public and um, frankly, I don't think that enough has been done in the intervening period that since I first um, addressed the committee on this to, um, to do that. I welcome the comments from Dorian Kelly and Sir Bob Russell this evening. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the comments that Dorian Kelly made about um, the, um, uh, the arts community and, and the cultural offering um, really getting behind um, a, a bid is, is, is fantastic. Um, but and I don't think the paper tonight goes far enough either, because I think that the paper tonight suggests that engagement will only be with sort of key stakeholders. Um, it suggests that it's just the great and the good that will be asked to, to support a bid for, for city status. Um, and it shouldn't just be that. Um, a previous administration, a previous cabinet, um, awarded um, coaches to the strapline of Britain's first city. And that um, caused um, a bit of a ruckus at the, uh, at the time. Um, and uh, it, the, um, the cabinet then was accused of being, of not engaging wide enough with the public um, on, uh, on that particular um, strapline. And I know that that strapline has not changed since the administration changed. Um, but at the time, the council was dubbed Britain's most arrogant council by Colchester's MP for not engaging wide enough. Uh, and um, it is really good, and, and, and Darris has always talked up Colchester, but it's been great to hear over the last few months some of his colleagues talking up Colchester again in a way that they hadn't done when they weren't running the council. Um, and I wonder if you might 
um, provide an opportunity for local people to also get behind the bid, to show them that they support your bid too, and to, and to seek that wider public support by um, offering a, a petition on the council's website that people can sign so that they can get behind the bid as well. And so that we can really show um, Her Majesty and the others making the decision about, um, about city status, that, um, that it does have that grassroots um, support from the community. Thank you, Councillor Fox. Councillor Laws. That's a really interesting uh, point about the petition and about wider engagement. I, I accept that we're going to need to do a bit more and I accept that on the chin what you say that we haven't done enough thus far. In the defence of myself and others though, this is a fast moving application that the bid has to be in by, by December. Um, we, we did, as uh, cabinet members and as councillors, we did consult to make sure that the, we were doing the right thing here. But yeah, let's do more. I, I will look at it um, personally. And, um, and also, I just wanted to make the point that we're also really conscious of the budget because, you know, we could have gone out to tender and brought in external consultants to do all of this. But I think that would have been a waste of money, frankly, because we had a, we had a pretty good bid in, in 2012. Um, Colchester itself is in a better place than it was in 2012. Um, particularly, I pay tribute to the work of uh, First Sight in, um, in what they've recently achieved. And, and that is all part of the, the mix that the, the cultural offering is, is critical, I think, in this. Um, so, yeah, I'll take away your points. I think they're really valid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ju just for clarity, everybody here, the um, decision this evening is for Cabinet to recommend it to full council. The final decision will be full council. We, you know, it is very important that all 51 councillors have their say on this, and, and obviously they will in the next full council, uh, providing we, we vote for it this evening. And uh, I really do thank Councillor Fox for his support in this matter. It's much appreciated. Um, thank you very much. It's really encouraging to hear. Um, the council has previously um, used its website to to allow um, residents to um, to sign up to pledges in the past. So the functionality is is there, um, and so I think it wouldn't be difficult um, uh, to do that. It's it's pleasing to hear that costs are being kept um, uh, low in terms of a, a bid, and I think that um, that all the great things about Colchester um, sells itself. Um, and so that we don't need, you know, to be spending lots of money on this. But the, um, but if the support is there from the public, we should really um, um, use uh, use the most of it. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a good point. Thank, thank you. Um, now, he may well have run down to the group room and run back in the interim. I don't know. But um, our next speaker, returning youth councillor Dennis Willits. Yes, here I am, leader, um, out of breath and uh, in great need of a big shock to bring me back to life. Um, on the matter of the, um, the bid for city status, uh, my concern is actually expressed in the first sentence of this evening's report. Uh, the Queen celebrates her Platinum Jubilee and there is an open call for local authorities to submit bids for city status for their towns. And that's, that's what the report says. That's what the invitation from uh, uh, the Lord Chamberlain's office says. Um, it's, it's about towns. And that really caused me to think about what is the area that is best served by city status. Now, I believe that there are huge opportunities, as Councillor Laws explained very succinctly, uh, for us uh, as a city with our Roman and our Norman heritage, our splendid features, uh, regional centre for the arts, a lot going, for, going on uh, for the centre of the town. But there, there is no clear definition of what is the town of Colchester, and I guess we can always um, expand that definition uh, or the requirement uh, in the call for, for, for bids to include the whole of the borough. Uh, but there have been several occasions when there is no clarity about what is the town of Colchester, what is the urban area of Colchester, and what is the borough. Well, I suppose there is absolute clarity what the borough of Colchester is. It's a case of, um, of, of when the borough is the, the appropriate um, uh, mechanism. Now, my ward leader, um, the ward I represent, uh, Lexton and Braiswick, I mean, Lexton is clearly in the town area and I have no doubt that they would wish and diligently hope to be within the, the city status of Colchester. 
Moving out, Braiswick is part of Myland Parish Council. They really see themselves as, as urbanites. Um, they, they use Colchester quite a, a lot. They would probably see themselves uh, as coming within a city of Colchester. But when you go out to the far extremities of the ward, West Burgholt, 8 Ash Green, Aldham, these are parished areas which are only loosely connected uh, with Colchester. Uh, half the population uh, of these villages um, don't really consider themselves to be Colchester at all, rarely come in, uh, and um, certainly Councillor Leatherdale is, is polling people in these villages, asking them why they don't come in, but that's a, another matter. And of course, in these uh, the, the rural areas, many remember the good old Lexton and Winstry Rural District Council, uh, which they recall in living memory representing them, and some would venture that the Rural District Council better understood the needs of the village uh, than um, the Borough Council. Um, and what really brings the matter to head is the fact that when we considered the town deal, we were asked to define what is the area of the town, uh, and this was done by the We Are Colchester, who have great, um, great enthusiasm for, um, uh, for the town deal bid. Um, but clearly, they thought that what really mattered was just the, the central areas of the town where there was um, significant deprivation. Um, and I think we do need absolute clarity in what is the appropriate area to become a city if we were so successful um, as to um, as to succeed in in our bid as i said i'm very enthusiastic for city status for the urban area but well aware that the villages that i represent are much less enthusiastic than I am, and many of you are, uh, about uh, city status. And of course, we've already mentioned several times this evening about the green fields in the areas where we live uh, and the Prime Minister's um, uh, undertaking that we're not going to build on them. And one really thinks, well, you know, shut up, is a city uh, an urban area uh, or is it the mass green fields which represent um, two thirds uh, of the borough. So I would ask the portfolio holders to give concerted thought to the definition of what should be a city if we're bidding for city status. It is easy to say, oh yes, we'll have the whole, the whole borough, but the whole borough does not look like a city to me, and many of the people within it will not be particularly pleased, enthusiastic, or even care to hoots about whether they are in the city. But nevertheless, it is a huge opportunity opportunity for the urban, the town area, uh, to go forward with city status, to bolster uh, Colchester as a regional centre. But I think there are dangers which need careful consideration um, before we draw the map of what will be the city. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Willits. I never feel a council meeting is complete unless we've mentioned Lexton and Winstree Rural Council at least once. Um, but there are some good points in there. Uh, Councillor Laws. I thank Councillor Witts for coming along here tonight. I know he comes from a very good place. And uh, what, what he's speaking about here is a lot about identity and how we, we feel that we, the identity of where we, our communities we live in. Now, I live in a village at the moment, but apparently once upon a time it was a town. So things can go the other way. Um, but no, I will, I will take on board what, what he has said and I will work with officers who are doing an excellent job in, in working on the preparation work. Should we be going for this to have a look at it in terms of uh, the definition um, the maps do matter. Uh, I'm a big fan of using the Ordnance Survey website and clicking on the various different levels of local government to find out where overlaps with what some of it, it, it frankly, all needs um, looking at, some of it does. But no, I'm going to look at that point, and I think the opportunity um, could, could be in also when, when it comes to potentially looking at the location of signage. That might be an interesting thing to consider because pe that matters for people when they are driving or cycling or walking through an area and they see that they are in the borough or they are in a city. Uh, I think that stuff does matter um, about how people feel about, about their communities. Um, and hopefully part of the engagement process that we can go through might address some of this and actually find out on the ground what people really, really feel. Thank you, Councillor Willits. Thank you, Councillor Laws. I think I'd, I'd just add, I mean, th thinking back to 2012, if I, if I dare mention our, our, our competitor then down the road who, who, who got awarded city status, um, obviously they have a similar setup that there are a number of small villages, parishes and that um, around Chelmsford. 
Um, and I, I, I may have missed it, but, but I, since they were awarded city status, I haven't heard any great ructions that um, small villages with parish councils suddenly feel that they've lost their identity or, or, or changed in any way. Um, I may be wrong, but um, I certainly uh, haven't heard any. Um, but our next speaker is Councillor G. Oxford. Councillor Oxford, you're very welcome. Yeah, I can move around it. Thanks, Andrew. Um, thank you, Leader. Um, I'm not going to go very much into the history side because Darius has dealt with that very adequately, other than to say a very well-recognised um, national television quiz show just before Christmas had a question which said, um, what is um, Britain's first city? And the, and the answer to the question was Colchester, and 10 out of the 100 people got it right. Um, so I was very pleased to see that question on, on, the, on the list uh, there. So um, the other thing as well is about city status. Um, I'm reliably informed by those who know about these things that even as far back as 1648 at the siege of Colchester, Colchester was referred to as the city. Uh, in fact, when the troops were at the gates to the, to the city, it's, it's exactly what it stated. So that's documentation for many centuries after Roman times, AD 49, when we became a city. And my, my view is that there's only ever one first in anything. And you'd excuse me for bringing in a two analogies, which you'd expect me to do. The first winner of the Grand National was lottery in 1838. And the first winner of the S. Epsom Derby was Diomed in 1780. Um, so obviously, I, uh, there's only one first. And it's important that we are and recognised as we are. That's why I think the strap line that Adam mentioned, um, Britain's first city, is absolutely accurate. And therefore, it's right that we've kept that. Um, but obviously, the uh, city status we are seeking now is more of a modern entity. And therefore, we're now entering into what I consider to be more of a business world where it would help us enhance us in the future. So um, I'm all for us going for it. And uh, let's hope Her Majesty sees fit to uh, issue it to us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Oxford. I thought that, that, that was a very good sum up, I thought. Um, Councillor Laws, is there anything you wish to add? Just thank you very much for your contribution there, Councillor Roxford, and also thank you very much for highlighting Colchester's role in the uh, Civil War. Of course, we were the a royalist settlement, and it was the folks from Ipswich that were not so keen, and uh, they were the ones who came here to cause us problems. Um, thankfully, we now have a very good relationship with Ipswich. Thank you. Thank you. I realise we've now mentioned Chelmsford and Ipswich in the same meeting, so I hope we don't get into much trouble. Um, Councillor Barber, on the next speaker. Thank you, Cabinet. You will be aware of my reservations on this matter, and I'm coming to attend this evening to give you the chance to convince me otherwise, um, because my current position would be that I would oppose us making a bid for city status if it was to come to full council. That's my current position, but I'm open-minded and willing to hear uh, the arguments. Uh, the reason I'm currently opposed is an identity matter. I believe we live in a town. I don't walk around the town and feel this is a city or should be a city. I don't walk around Braswick where I live and speak to people and they think this should be a city. They live in a town, they want to live in a town. And I don't believe conferring city status to us would address any of the issues that my residents care about and that I, I feel challenge our borough. I don't feel that it would assist us in addressing the MIBA. I don't believe there would be an indirect benefit of being a city status that would therefore bring those improvements. If there were different responsibilities we were granted as a result of city status, more flexibility on investment and responsibilities, I could see an argument, but I don't feel currently that city status would confer that uh, any benefit on us from that perspective. That's my current view. I don't believe that 
city status is particularly prestigious in itself. I believe that we need cities, towns and villages in our country to make it what it is, um, as well as open countryside and all other aspects of our society. I believe cities themselves have challenges, uh, stark challenges that aren't addressed by being a city in themselves. I think that all the wonderful uh, points that Council Law has made about our borough, and I don't think there's anyone better to oversee as cabinet member um, our heritage uh, than Councillor Laws. I think he's brilliant. And I don't think I've ever had any disagreement with Councillor Laws on anything at all. Uh, so I, I couldn't have someone more that I'd want in charge of heritage, uh, and I completely mean that. Uh, but I don't see how city status would improve any of those wonderful things we have. We have them as a town, and I believe that is our identity, and therefore it would be a high bar to convince me to lose that identity for city status, um, it, would, it would take significant benefits for the residents I represent to lose that identity. And that's just a feeling I have, it's kind of intangible. And therefore I want to come in with an open mind for you to convince me because I know there's a lot of people who support it, but currently just my feeling is that I don't want to be a city. And I think our villages are amazing, but I don't think they'll be improved by becoming towns. I want them to be villages because I think that's an integral part of our society. And I think there's some wonderful parts of our village with heritage as well. And I know this cabinet recognizes that entirely. And I just don't feel changing our status would lead to any improvements for my residents. And that's the difficulty I have because it ultimately comes down to an identity factor. Um, so currently I think I'm opposed to it, but I am willing to be open-minded and listen to the arguments because I, I think I have a duty to be open-minded. And I led that ruckus against uh, uh, Councillor Fox referred to um, back on the Britain's First City matter. I called it in uh, for scrutiny and I said that I didn't think the consultation aspect was good enough. And I recognise this is something the Cabinet do want to pursue. So on that basis, I would encourage, uh, and I'm sh sure, I know Councillor Laws has said he'll take this away. So that's very, com uh, I think that's important. So I, I have my identity hesitancies, I guess. And I don't say that lightly because I know a lot of people want this and I know that a lot of thought is going into it. So it, it does give me a bit of difficulty um, saying that, I guess. But that's just how I feel, and sometimes that's difficult to overcome, I suppose. And that's how I genuinely feel on the matter. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Laws, would you like to... Uh, Councillor Barber, I'm really grateful that you've been candid this evening. I think there are people that do have doubts, so it's, it's good to be honest about that, and let's have that conversation. I think if you're open-minded to this, then we have a chance. We have a chance to persuade you. I think you, you, you strike me as someone that's perhaps a bit ambivalent, more so than, than angrily against it, and not, you're not going to come and, uh, and tie me up and do nasty things to me over it. Um, but hopefully in time we can, we can persuade you of the merits of this. And I do accept a lot of this is soft and, and, and intangible, um, but I would I, I urge you to, to, to perhaps look at, look at the maps. Um, and, and go for a little walk around on Google Street View and, and see what, 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 what cities can be like. Um, I, I've, I've just had a weekend in Norwich and I just thought it was phenomenal. There was so much choice and, and diversity and options and um, all, all right, they were, they're, 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 they've got challenges as well. But actually, um, the same can be said about Chelmsford. You know, the, um, the, the, bond, the bond Street development and, and the high street, the, the, the pedestrianisation of the high street there. It's some wonders. Um, that's another matter. But, but I think, I think we, 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 we're going to try and persuade you. Um, but uh, but I, welcome, I welcome you being a critical friend. It's good to have critical friends. Thank you. Oh, I mean, I'm sure they'll be, I'm sure we'll have the debate. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well because it's important. And I, I actually welcome a refreshingly approach um, from the cabinet uh, about that. I think that's good that you're willing to have that debate because that's important. And I, I commend you for what you're doing uh, in general. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barber. I mean, yep, I would agree. You know, identity is important and, and, and it's a very personal thing, I think. And uh, sometimes you, you, it it's, comes down to gut feeling sometimes, but I think, and that's why it's important actually that um, every councillor has their say on this. Obviously, I hope 
that when it goes to full council, we'll get a really good endorsement from councillors for the bid, but equally I appreciate not everybody feels the same way and, and they're entitled to say and feel and vote exactly as they wish. Um, that's all the speakers, I think. Are any other cabinet members wish to say anything on this item before we move to the decision? So just to sum up, the recommended decision is cabinet is requested to note the process to deliver cultures to bid for city status, the plan for engagement and the time, st time scale required to recommend to full council that endorses and supports Colchester's bid for city status and to delegate authority to agree the final wording of Colchester's application for city status to the portfolio holder for economy, business and heritage. Uh, are we in agreement, members? I see everybody indicating positively. I think that has been decided. So we will move on to the next item which is item 81 budget 2223 a medium term financial forecast we have three speakers on this but before we do that i will ask councillor lissimore to introduce the item thank you very much i just like to say my sincere thanks to all the officers that have been dealing with this on a a, a daily basis it is something that that we discuss in meetings extremely often as i say virtually on a daily basis um, the reason that we bring this here today is to balance the 2022-23 budget and to revise the medium term financial forecast the mtff and uh, i'd like to present to say the uh, the papers to you thank you thank you councillor this more we'll, we'll move to the visiting councillors uh, first on the list is councillor corey i don't know uh, I, I think the monitoring officer is going to read a statement, uh, monitoring officer. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Leader. I've got a statement here from uh, Councillor Corey as chair of the scrutiny panel in support of the recommendation that you've got from the scrutiny panel last night. It was discussed at length by scrutiny panel with the following outcome agreed by all that scrutiny sets up a subgroup to discuss the funding of a youth we need to continue to discuss this issue in line with the recommendations agreed by scrutiny and cabinet at its meeting on September the 1st that members are included in the discussions over the 400,000 funding for the youth zone, including at budget workshops. I strongly believe that since agreeing this recommendation, members have had little chance to progress the discussions. Previously, the leader and this cabinet supported the youth zone in principle and said that the political will was there. Councillor Lissimore promised last night to continue to work with members to find ways to fund the youth zone and better youth services if viable suggestions are put forward. I welcome this. And that is the end of the statement. Thank you. Thank you, Managing Officer. I think um, at what point do we deal with the recommendation from the scrutiny panel? It would now be a good moment? Yes, Leader. Yes, uh, just checking that before I got it wrong. Um, we have discussed the recommendation from the scrutiny panel. It was a long evening last night and quite a cold evening as well. Um, there were a number of recommendations thrown around. So I did some draft wording to the Democratic Services Officer, which incorporates, uh, it doesn't change any of the wording which came from um, the scrutiny panel. It just, it does add a sentence at the end. I don't know if I could perhaps just ask Mr. Clifford to see if he's got it to hand. Sorry, sorry, I think, Richard. I think the monitoring officer has it to hand. I've, I've caught you on the spot there. Yes, uh, Leader, I've got it. Uh, would you like me to read the, the original recommendation and then your additional? That would be line. very helpful, yeah. thank you. Right, so the, ori the original recommendation is recommended to Cabinet that further work be conducted by a subgroup of the scrutiny panel to meet informally and identify and discuss potential options for providing and, providing and funding a future youth zone whilst maintaining a balanced budget for the Council. And your additional wording as suggested leader is the subgroup should aim to work towards finding a broad political consensus on an agreed site which meets on sides criteria, capital financing options and contingency in the annual revenue cost, which recognises that £400,000 in quarter one to 2021 cost based 
and will experience cost pressure uplift by the time of completion. Thank you. Um, is that something we're happy with? Yes? Oh, sorry, Councillor Lissimore. Um, yes, I certainly agree with that because it is really just a clarification on what was discussed at the scrutiny meeting last night. Um, we're not there at this meeting and to those listening at home, um, there are a number of issues. We can have the will, if we wish, to move forward to look into a youth zone, but there needs to be the funding for the building itself, which at present is estimated at at least £8 million. There has to be revenue funding for the site, year in, year out, ongoing, forever and ever. And there also has to be a site. At present, none of those three criteria have been met. So we are very, very keen in both budget workshops and in this subgroup of the scrutiny committee for them to look at those three points and to try and come up with a solution which will allow a balanced budget and a balanced medium term financial forecast leading forward. Thank you. Thank you, yes, and I, I just add that I, I, I genuinely wish the, the, the sub panel well and uh, I look, look forward to hearing what they have to say. So I think we are, we've agreed that. I see no dissent. So uh, Mr. Weavers, you can take that as, as agreed. And we now move to Councillor Pearson. Only one hour, 46 minutes. Uh, you had to wait. <laughs> um, but uh, good evening. Evening all. Can I just start um, before I ask my questions and make my comments by saying that uh, as chair of the Labour group on this council, I uh, hope you will accept the whole of my group's best wishes for Councillor Crowell to have a speedy recovery. Um, my questions and comments are really to the deputy leader and portfolio holder for resources leader. <coughs> and I just wonder, uh, if she could respond to the following, please. In <clears throat> paragraph 7.2, there's a reference to uh, containing pressures and the main pressure on inflation being pay. Uh, could I ask why what we know about energy and fuel rises going up astronomically aren't also included here? Paragraph 10.1 also has um, some rather convoluted language about cabinet agreeing that fees and charges would increase annually by the past three years average rate of council tax increase. The MTFF um, assumes that these inflationary increase, increases are used by services to meet the cost of increments and other local service pressures. So could I ask um, the portfolio holder just to explain what the meaning of this bit of gobbledygook actually is in pounds and pence, please? Um, in paragraph 13.7, there's reference to extensive modeling work having been undertaken. Uh, could we have, and, and I would ask that this goes to all councillors, some specifics about just what that extensive modeling was and is. And finally, paragraph 14.1 um, refers to uh, comparator districts, uh, yet doesn't name any of the councils that we've been compared to. So again, could I have the details of those councils? Councillor Simor. Thank you. I think if some of those questions are quite technical. It will be best to get written answers um, for you, those from the finance officer. So thank you. I will ensure that those are sent to you. Could those be sent to all councillors, please? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and our next speaker is Councillor Willits.
Welcome back. Well, Leader, I'd actually put my name down to support Councillor Corey's um, uh, presentation on the work of the scrutiny panel, which you've already dealt with and voted on, so I'm not sure whether it's worth saying anything, but on the basis that I like saying things, uh, I, I, I will continue. Um, I mean, the, the, the scrutiny panel's view was that e Essex County Council is the statutory authority for youth services, but amongst the humble backbenchers of which I number myself one, uh, all party-wise, there is um, strong support for accelerating the provision of a youth zone uh, in the town. And we are keen, therefore, uh, that in this year's budget, there should be some acknowledgement of what is a sort of a groundswell opinion uh, amongst the members uh, for a much needed service. Uh, we were advised by the, uh, uh, the Chief Executive that we do have general power of competence to do this if we wish. We can go it alone, uh, although it will be more expensive to do it that way. So the issues are, first of all, we have to raise the priority of a youth zone uh, in the budgetary process. That is the problem. Uh, the solution is that if that is raised, something else has got to be demoted or extra income, as you, um, uh, as you drew to our attention earlier on, Leader, extra income has to be found because uh, we do need a solution and a problem to match. And up to now, everyone's talking about the problem and no one seems to be talking about the budgetary solution until we got the resolution um, yesterday. Now, if progress on a youth zone is to be included in this year's uh, budget, then there needs to be some very, very fast footwork um, to get information into your hands, leader, so that you can see whether it is feasible um, to, to, to do so. Uh, and this council takes good decisions, but it generally takes a long time to, to actually arrive at these good decisions. And what we need here is a process which will get us an understanding of how we're going to furnish a solution to the financial problem for the youth zone in days, uh, hopefully not even weeks. Um, so thank you for agreeing the recommendation, but I think you're now turning it back uh, onto we humble backbenchers because we have now got to get down to work um, answer the questions which you are posing to us this evening um, and and then there is some hope uh, that the budget can um, can give some support to this particular project uh, there was the the possibility of doing this work at the uh, general members uh, budgetary workshop but no progress was made uh, whatsoever which i found very disappointing so i hope that um, with your agreement this evening uh, to set up a subgroup we will now see instant action lightning fast speed to come back and answer your questions and if we don't then i would say to my other my colleagues who've been saying we must have a youth zone if you don't do the work if you don't answer the questions it is on it is th our own fault that we don't make progress so it's up to us to actually do what you're asking uh, and respond uh, with answers to the questions thank you Thank you, Councillor. Well, some good points. Just, just for clarity, it was the, the humble backbenchers on the scrutiny panel who, who volunteered themselves to, to leap into rapid action. Uh, um, it, it was their idea, and I look forward to hearing what they have to say. Um, on the budget workshops, we do have another budget workshop coming up, but I, I would emphasise the point, and I think Councillor Willits made it, 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 that you can't just go to those workshops advocating, promoting something. You have to say what you're going to demote as well because there have to be two sides of the equation for it to be a credible argument. Uh, Councillor Lissabon, is there anything you wish to add? Or? Just a couple of points from the scrutiny meeting last night. Um, one was um, a comment, I can't remember now which councillor made it, who said, would any of you sitting around at this committee meeting um, put money on the fact that we're talking about a 400,000 um, cost per year um would anybody put any money on on that staying at four hundred thousand? we know we have inflationary pressures at the moment we know um costs are going up and not a single member of the committee came back 
and said, no, I think 400,000 is about right. So I think we have to admit, whilst a couple of years ago, it may have looked like it would cost 400,000 a year to run one, it would probably be considerably more. And as Councillor Dundas said, if we go forward with this, not only have we got the site, um, we have got to find the money to build it and the money to fund it going on and on and on. And it was the recommendation from the Chief Financial Officer that the funding that had been put in the MTFF was removed. And as councillors, we have a duty to give a balanced budget. All of us as councillors, whatever political party we were, we are, have a duty to do that. And that was explained very fully at, at scrutiny last night. And it was a, a very, although very long, but a very interesting meeting. It was, just, just, just for clarity on, on the annual cost of running a youth zone, the, the actual cost is estimated at 2021 20, figures to be 1.3 million a year. The, the model assumes that funding will be found from various third parties, benefactors, or whatever, to bring the net cost to the council down to around 400,000. But obviously we have to recognize as a council, were there to be any shortfall in that, and that funding not to be obtained, uh, and the commitment asked for is only three years, um, so, you may get all the funding, but it's only for three years. We cut the shortfall, so so we have to be aware of that when when committing ourselves to this. That either from the start it could be well over four hundred thousand if that funding is not found, and after three years, if it's not renewed, we are obviously liable to a potential uplift up to one point three million pounds in in twenty twenty one prices. Um, final speaker on this is Councillor Barber. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add some words on this to highlight the productive work that Culture Borough Council and Essex County Council are doing in regards to uh, youth services. Uh, before I nip off to the pub, I'll say a few uh, words on this uh, because I'm, I'm deputy to the cabinet member at uh, Essex County Council, Councillor McKinley, who has responsibility for youth services. And we've been working over the last few months together with Culture Borough Council productively to explore how best to invest in our youth services, um, including with the funds we've been allocated through the town deal, which is a sizable pot of money. I do think it's worthwhile stressing the significant investment from uh, the government through the town deal fund and also um, obviously this council playing a part in that in our town. Uh, in the central services, the townhouse that we have, which is a fantastic facility and will have some amazing uh, investment in it, which will really transform the youth services in the centre of our town. And uh, I, I think those productive discussions will continue uh, between officers and councillors on our youth services. I'm really excited to see what will come from them. In regards to the County Council's position on youth, serve, uh, on youth zones, uh, the Cabinet members made this clear to County members in our full Council meeting, and I'm happy to share her response uh, to various councils, although it is public, I will for convenience sake share that with this Cabinet so they are aware of the County Council's position. I know that's been explained to you in our meetings uh, too, but not least, I think it's important for the record just to remember what our borough is like, which is in many parts very rural still and how a youth zone won't necessarily serve all of this borough um, adequately whereas the model we have in the county is slightly different in that we look to ensure that services are delivered locally to people and that's the model we feel uh, delivers most successfully and has been delivering for young people uh, the cabinet member did attend a youth zone in barking i think we recognize as an authority that they are a fantastic facility uh, However, in the response she gave to one of the members at the county, she did stress that embarking, for example, that has replaced youth provision completely. Their youth provision was gone. They had no other youth services whatsoever. So the youth zone was the only uh, facility being provided in a very different geographic and demographic um, area, a tightly knit uh, area uh, geographically with a much younger population as well and with different transport links. If I think, for example, in my division, would someone from Little Hawksley uh, be able to easily get to a youth zone in the centre of culture? I'm not so sure that would be the case, although it would serve many people well. But 
Uh, the county has a particular model of delivering youth services. We feel that's working well. Um, however, we will continue the good work between county and the borough council uh, that has been productively being discussing how we can continue to invest in youth services in Colchester. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Barber. I have to say, yeah, we've certainly had some very positive meetings. Uh, um, um, I, I've certainly learned a lot. I, and I think it's a good point that while we're talking about funding potentially youth zone in, in sort of three or four years time that because that's how long it'll take it to get built and actually actually get up and operational we shouldn't take our eye off the ball that we have 1.3 million uh, investment through the town deal fund which we need to get the business case together quickly on to confirm that funding uh, immediately so so we need to uh, not forget about that and make sure that we we get that underway really quickly does anybody else wish to say anything on this subject so um, we have a recommend if nobody other cabinet members wish to say anything more I think we have no more speakers and we do have a recommended decision oh sorry Darius beg your pardon thank you leader just very briefly on under item 9.1 funding for arts partners I just want to put on record my gratitude to the portfolio holder for resources and the leader for agreeing that we do this I think it's been a historic anomaly and potentially goes um, back to what well, it, it, it perhaps because we have annual elections and um, so certain budgetary items get, get set, got, got set annually. Um, it's right that we fund our arts partners on a four yearly basis. It, it works for their, um, their external funding models much better, their business planning. Uh, and I just want to put on record the great work that Steve Mannix, Sally Shaw and Anthony Roberts do uh, at first sight, the Mercury Theatre and the Colchester Arts Centre. Hopefully this will give them a little bit of a boost, a bit more confidence to know that we back them. We back them for four years and they can go out there proudly putting our logo on their bid applications and win money for their work and to enhance Colchester because of it so um, thank you very much guys thank you uh, before we move to decision I uh, also we, we have um, our section 151 officer on the call and also the chief operating officer here is there anything they wish to add to this item no okay in which case we'll move to the recommended decision i'm not going to read it all out because it's quite long but it's contained in section two of the uh, agenda item uh so cabinet members are we in agreement we are i see everybody uh nodding in confirmation therefore that is um passed um i do note it's 8 p.m and we'll be going for two hours um, would anybody like a brief comfort? Oh. Carry on for the time being. Yep, keep going. Okay, that seems to be the view. Uh, item 8.2 is 2021 year end review of risk. I think it's also resources, I believe. So, Councillor Lissimore, I suppose. Thank you very much. Um, just to, again, thank officers for all the work that they've done on this item and um, the papers are as read. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody wishes to add anything to this item? I see, was that an indication, Councillor Ellis? No, I said we've been through this already, so no, I'm happy. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll move to the recommended decisions, uh, which is to consider and comment on the council's progress and performance in managing risk during the period April 20 to March 21. Consider and comment on the current strategic risk register and to approve the proposed risk management strategy for 21-22 and recommend to full council that it be, be included in the council's policy framework. So are we all in agreement on that? I see indications in the positive for everybody. So that is agreed. And if we move to item nine, and I find the right page on my laptop, which is right down here somewhere, which is progress of responses to the public. And let me just find the, it's here somewhere. It go? Page 65 channel. Okay, I'll go back to the agenda. You see, see this is where paperless agendas fall apart. This is the problem. Uh, Cabinet will consider a report giving an update on the progress of responses to members of the public who have made representations under the have your say provisions at meetings of council and cabinet. Um, this is under general. Have we anybody in particular who wishes to present this report or has anybody got anything they wish to say on it? 
No, we have, we have no speakers, uh, public or, or visiting councillors. Um, therefore, I think we will just move straight to the recommended decision. Which is it's just a note, Chairman. Well, just note. Well, I think we'll consider that noted. Okay. And that, I think I'm running saying, concludes the public part of the meeting. Let Chairman, you need check. to move the motion for the exclusion. I, I, I will do that in a minute. I was just checking we hadn't got any housekeeping items at the end regarding anything else. No, we haven't. Therefore, I shall move the following motion. I move that in, accord, in accordance with section 100A brackets 4 of the Local Government Act 1972, and in accordance with the local authorities bracket executive arrangements, close brackets, meetings and access to information, England, regulations 2012, the public, including members of the press, be excluded from the meeting for the following items as they involve the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph three of part one of schedule 12A to the Local Government Act 1972. Are we in agreement with that? We are, therefore,